so this week I'm very pleased to introduce Jeremy England. And when we first contacted him last year, uh, or maybe two years ago even, the, the, lots of discussion about when he could come to visit and so on, but then obviously that was all on hold. So I'm very pleased that he's managing to give up some of his time for us today. He was at MIT when I first contacted him, but now um, he's moved to a combination of uh, Georgia tech and private industry. Um, and I was going to say a little more about that, but he could tell you the correct story because my information is out of date. And I was also going to tell you that he's got a new book, but he's going to show a slide of his book so you can learn from him. So it's all yours, Jeremy. Take it away. Thanks very much, Douglas, and uh, thank you all. It's a pleasure to have the chance to address you today. So I'm looking forward to telling you about a number of different stories that uh, started in my group when I was at MIT uh, and have continued since then uh, through collaboration, either at Georgia Tech um, from theory into experiment and beginning with relatively abstract theoretical ideas and ending uh, in what I hope is a, a more operationalized set of principles for going out into messy systems and looking for predictive principles that uh, bring them together. So uh, to begin with, I'll start by talking about something that maybe seems a little bit remote from, uh, let's say, the, the physics of many body systems, but it's an intuition that I think is important for getting us rolling with the kind of thinking that we want to try to do um, about the kind of physics that we're going to discuss. So. Let's think about living things and what we mean when we say a living thing is well adapted to its environment. So clearly, if we're talking about a whale that has fins that allow it to swim through the water or a bird that has wings that allow it to fly, it seems sort of natural and obvious that there are forms in living things that have particular functions that enable them to accomplish tasks. And then we see those tasks playing a role in the flourishing and survival uh, of the living organism. And if you try to kind of zoom in a little bit more to come up with something slightly more molecular, and I don't know if it's more simple, but at least it's uh, something smaller. You imagine a bacterium living in a jar uh, with some sugars that what we mean when we say that it has a well-adapted relationship to its environment is that there's some kind of specialization in the structure of the living thing as a collection of matter that we can recognize as far as how it interacts with some patterned feature of the environment. So if I have sugars of particular chemical structure, then if I have the enzymes to break them down, then I can eat the sugars. And if I lack the enzymes to break them down, then maybe I can't. Now, having or lacking an enzyme from the standpoint of the physical assembly of a bacterium is just about how the same atoms are arranged differently. We don't usually think of it that way because we're disposed to think of living things in terms of genes and proteins and phenotypes and stuff like that. But as a physical system, it's a bundle of atoms which clearly could either have or not have a particular ability to interact with a chemical source of energy in its environment just because the same atoms got put together in a different way. And I, I think that's the thing that we really want to push on and, and try to generalize if we're going to get out of the biological frame and into a physical one that is maybe a bit more general and can embrace other kinds of systems. That when we recognize that functional relationship, what we're really saying is that we think that there's something exceptional about the particular way that the particles in the system are put together that makes it have an ability with regard to its environment that it wouldn't have if it were in a random arrangement of those same particles. So I can take all the atoms or even smaller, sorry, larger pieces uh, of the bacterium and randomly shuffle them. And presumably I'm not gonna get back something that has highly specialized enzymes for breaking down certain sugars. And the very fact that that failure in the random case is kind of obvious is part and parcel to our ability to recognize function, right? If we, if we saw structures and wanted to claim that they have a particular ability Clearly, in some sense, we're saying, and this is better at doing the thing that we're claiming than some random rearrangement of the constituent parts, because if that's not true, then what does it mean to be a structure that achieves a function? It's not so difficult to do the thing you're talking about. So, you know, you can use any old lump of matter. So that's the uh, beginning point for this discussion is how do we take this idea from biological examples and try to widen the field a bit and say, let's think about comparing the structure that I see in a collection of many particles sticking together in some way to 
random rearrangements of those constituent parts. And then in that comparison, am I going to have the ability to recognize exceptionality that has to do with a relationship to something in the environment that I can define in a clear way physically? Uh, and if we're, if we're going to succeed at that, then um, we, we may have the chance to start to think like we sometimes do about evolution and adaptation in a biological context, but apply that thinking to the physical dynamics or evolution of adaptations uh, in systems that have a physical description, but definitely aren't alive. So this is the point that I, I was essentially just making. We're clearly not only restricted though to talking about jumbles of atoms. Uh, we can think about any system with many degrees of freedom, many different variables that describe the state of the system as a whole, and all the different states the system could be in, all the different dynamical trajectories that could be taken traversing those different states. And then we can pose this question, how do we generalize beyond phenotypic ideas in biology and start talking instead about some kind of corresponding notion of adaptation in a physical chemical sense? What would it mean to say that the structure on the left is a better adapted structure given the environment than the structure on the right in some non-equilibrium scenario like life is where you have energy coursing through and there's some kind of possible relationship between the structures that form in the system and the sources of energy in the surrounding environment? So when I first began uh, thinking about this a while back, the formalism that we were developing at the time was to try to think in terms of a generalization of the Boltzmann distribution. So the Boltzmann distribution is what you get if you just take matter and let it sit for a long time at constant temperature, and it just fluctuates around and jumbles around. And eventually you expect that the probability of being in any given state, J or K, it's just going to be ruled by the difference in energy between those two states. And that first Boltzmann term is still here in the non-equilibrium generalization. So the Boltzmann factor of e to the minus delta ejk over um, kvt is just telling you states with higher energy are, are less likely. And exactly how much less likely is controlled by the temperature. That's still going to be true in an arbitrary non-equilibrium scenario. But in non-equilibrium, you also have to think about other things. You need to think about where you started and how much time has elapsed since you were there. Because if you're just looking at a finite time, then it might be that you're more likely to be somewhere because you're close to where you started or that you're more diffusively accessible to it. Or, you know, there's a generalization of closeness that you could try to develop. But even perhaps more interesting for this discussion uh, is the other factor that appears, which wasn't here previously. So in the non-equilibrium setting, you don't just have your internal energy changing over time. You also have work that's being done on the system, right? You have forces that are pushing on you while you move. And then some of that energy stays in the system, but some of it leaves as heat and gets dissipated into the surroundings. So if you take this factor over here on the right, sorry, I can move my cursor here. This set of factors over here, the interesting thing is we're talking not just about the work being done at a particular instant, but really the whole history of how you get from a starting state I to an ending state J or K. And notice interestingly that the J is on the bottom here, even though it's on the top there. So what that means is that if I'm gonna get from I to J, there's all sorts of ways I could do that. I have external forces pushing on me that are changing over time in the environment. So there's gonna be work that's done as I go from I to J. And if I do that again, a different amount of work is gonna be done because there are fluctuations. I'm not gonna take exactly the same microscopic trajectory. So really you, need, you have this whole ensemble of possible values of work that get done as I go from one state to another. And, and these are ideas that really came out of work starting in the late nineties by people like Chris Jarzinski and Gavin Crooks um, that really caused a renaissance in the whole field of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. So I'm gonna average this exponential of the work over all those possible dynamical trajectories, all the different ways of getting from one place to another. And then what you can see is that overall, if I wanna make J more likely than K over here, I want J to be a more likely outcome than K given the way that I'm being driven, then what I need is for there to be an exceptional distribution of work values as I go from I to J, that means that as I get, as I undergo that process, I'm much more likely to do lots of positive work down here, which will make this probability bigger uh, as compared to the opposite factor up here. So it's a little more complicated than speaking loosely, as I've been saying, because averaging exponentials, you care, it's a, it's a cumulative generating function. You care about all these different uh, aspects of the shape of the work distribution. 
Uh, but the basic idea is that if somehow there's no way of getting from I to J without having tons of work done on me, whereas there are a variety of ways of getting from I to K, and maybe some of them don't involve much work at all, um, then this one is going to win. And I think the way to think about this is that the same way that it's not always true that going to low energy dominates the behavior of a many body system, right? You know, we have this Boltzmann factor here and it seems like it's saying, oh, you prefer to go to low energy, but clearly sometimes you get ice and sometimes you get steam and it actually depends on what temperature you're at. So going to the lowest energy state is not guaranteed. Nonetheless, the fact that energy is a draw, the fact that lowering your energy allows you to justify a high probability in this kind of a distribution does point to the fact that there are scenarios in which that effect can dominate, right? So you can form crystals that are low energy and their low entropy is paid for by the fact that there's this very strong draw from this Boltzmann factor. Similarly here, we don't always know that the place that we go to that's most likely has the most exceptionally positive work history. But what it points to is that there are scenarios which might be interesting ones where that is the dominant factor, where the place you end up, the attractor that you end up being stable in, the story of that stability is gonna be written in terms of the history of absorbing work from the environment and dissipating it over time as you go from I to J. And I, I think one thing I'll add on top of that uh, is that there are two things you have to be careful about here. The first is that not all systems are created equal in the sense that some of them are going to be kind of unremarkable in that no matter what shape you're in, you're able to absorb roughly the same amount of work from your environment. But there are gonna be other system environment relationships where you may have a very specialized possibility and in terms of the interaction between the environment and the system, where only if you're in particular special shapes are you gonna be able to absorb energy from the environment. And that is a key point, right? Because now if I say, oh, well, my likely behavior is that I have this exceptionally positive work history sorry, it, that if I'm in a likely state at the end, that I had to have this exceptionally positive dynamical history where I absorbed a lot of work. And it's also true in your system that given the way the system is being driven, you have to be in special shapes in order to absorb that work. That's where we start to see the hint of something intriguing, right? Because that means that the likely outcome that you're eventually in implies something about the shapes you used to be in, the history of the states that you had to traverse. And that's the reason we ultimately wanna use the word adaptation here, because this ends up being like a generalization of the notion of evolutionary adaptation in the case of natural selection and self-replication. And there's actually a rigorous connection there, which I can flesh out for anyone who wants to ask about it later. Um, one is really a special case of the other, but the physical more general frame, the way that we're talking again, is that our eventual end state has a likelihood that it is impacted by the whole history of special shapes that you've gotten to traverse in the past that had a specialized and rare matched relationship somehow uh, to the environment uh, as far as the ability of the system to absorb energy from the pattern of the external drive. That's the core concept of the idea of dissipative adaptation that we're gonna be kind of running forward with um, in the rest of this talk. And I think that the, the key point also to make before jumping into things is that there are still different cases that this breaks into. Why is that? Well, because on the one hand, if you are going to have a history where you absorb a lot of work on the way to where you're going, it might be that at the end, you're very good at absorbing work and one can discuss examples of that. It's also possible though, that even though your history of absorbing work was very exceptional, that you've ended up in a state where you're not very good at absorbing work now. And that latter case is actually gonna be the focus of, of the rest of what we look at uh, in the slides that I have prepared, although I'm happy to entertain other notions um, uh, in discussions because we have papers about the other case as well. But that's a point that's often missed in this discussion is that we're not talking about always absorbing more work from the surroundings. There clearly are examples where that doesn't happen. But what we are talking about is the idea that the imprint of your history of absorbing work is visible in the final state of the system, regardless of whether you're still good at absorbing work or not. And this is really because of a feedback loop that closes where your changes in shape are both things that are powered by the energy you absorb from the environment, and also they control your ability to absorb energy from the environment. So you end up with this biased exploration 
of a space of configurations that is influenced by how energy is able to flow into the system. So here's a concrete example of that. We are familiar with the idea that when you sing or play some loud tone of some frequency at a crystal goblet, that you can make it shatter, right? There is energy in the sound field. It has a particular pattern. And if the glass is shaped in the right way, then it'll move around a lot. It'll absorb that, that energy. And it will undergo contortions that are so great that it can actually really shatter the whole structure of the glass. But then once that happens, you're in a different state that's not so good at absorbing energy from the sound field any anymore. So even if you leave the sound on, the rate of energy absorption of those shards is not gonna be the same as for the goblet in its original shape. And what that calls our attention to is that this is an example where the same working material, the same matter can be in different configurations. And some of them are good antennae for the energy source in the environment given its pattern. And some of them are not. Now, in this case, you see a, an irreversible transformation powered by the absorption of that energy that puts you into a state that's worse at absorbing energy. And that sounds sometimes to us like it's less lifelike or less interesting. Although I, I, as we go forward, I think I'd like to argue it ends up recapitulating a different kind of example of lifelike behavior than we often are attuned to thinking about, but still quite an interesting one. But I think that the, the best way to start to appreciate that there's still a kind of fine tuning that you can bring about in the system, even as energy absorption is going down, is that if you imagine I had a whole bunch of goblets like this of different shape, where they all were the same kind of matter, but shaped differently so that some of them resonate and some of them don't. And then I beam in my sound field and I shatter all the ones that resonate. Clearly the total rate of energy absorption from that collective is gonna go down. And so then coming along later, if I said, oh, well, let me look at this collection of different goblets, I'd say, oh, these actually look like they've been specially selected all to not absorb energy from the drive that a randomly arranged goblet might might have actually been better at absorbing energy, but I eliminated all of those from view by shattering them. And so that's obviously not the experiment that we're you know, about to go do, but what it points to is that fine tuning to an environmental pattern and selection is something that can happen even if your eventual state is one where you're not absorbing more energy than you did previously. Um, and actually, if we start to try to make that idea rigorous, it turns out to give you predictive power in a variety of settings that can turn out to be interesting. Um, so the way that we've started to talk about this since uh, a paper that came out of the group several years ago um, by a then graduate student who's now a postdoc that I'm, I'm still very happy to be working with named Pavel Chibikov um, is what we're called, we call it low rattling feedback. So the idea uh, it basically is this, that if you have many degrees of freedom, that there are gonna be some things about what they're doing that are kind of slow and some things that they're doing that are kind of fast. And the fast dynamics when the system is being driven is gonna make a big difference to how it absorbs energy from the surroundings, at least in a variety of cases and quite a general class of cases. But the slow dynamics of how the overall shape might change like large scale rearrangements in the structure of the glass or large scale rearrangements in which pieces of the system are where, that's going to relax more slowly and in a way that really depends on the rate of energy absorption by the fast variables because the fast variables absorb energy and they both have a decision to make, so to speak, about how much energy they're gonna absorb. And also they could be absorbing that through very orderly motion or they could be absorbing it through very randomizing motion. And the point is that the more energy they're absorbing and the more they randomize that energy, the more being driven by the environment is basically like jumping up the temperature of the system. And when you jump up the temperature of the system, you can make very big rearrangements because you can go over high barriers in the energy landscape. But the more that the system is either reducing its energy absorption or finding a way to make that energy absorption produce regular motion, the more it's possible that you're not gonna really thermalize the energy that's flowing through the system. And then you're not gonna be able to jump up those uh, slow degrees of freedom and, and make really massive rearrangements in the configuration of the system. So what that points to is that if you can ever find low energy absorbing or orderly behaviors, then you kind of get stuck in them. It's hard to get out of them once you find them. So that's the low rattling idea. Um, and we first explored this in a simple system that just had two variables. So it was what's called a kicked rotor, uh, which is just a pendulum on a pivot that you can think of it as though it's in outer space on a rocket ship that has boosts on its rocket only at you know, midnight every day, so to speak. So your uh, 
for a short period of time and experience an acceleration that's pointing in one direction, and then you turn that off. So it's just a delta pulse in time of acceleration of some amplitude. And then the parameter you can control is the amplitude. If you do very high amplitude on the right, then you tend to get chaotic diffusive dynamics for the, well, I shouldn't say diffusive yet. You get chaotic dynamics for the pendulum. And then if you put the pendulum on a pivot that's actually sliding around on a track, then that track will diffuse because it's coupled to something that's chaotic. And that's what you see in the bottom right is the position of the track over time. However, if your amplitude of driving is lower, then there actually are orderly orbits that are admitted to the dynamics of the same system. And as a result, you can actually have behaviors that average out to zero displacement over time uh, because they integrate out to a closed loop. So you have an orderly orbit from the pendulum and it doesn't go anywhere because the track doesn't have any net force on it over time. So those are two different scenarios that just result from different amounts of kicking, like how, how violently you're hitting the system, how strong your rocket boosters are basically. And the first thing we did was just show that you can shuffle probability around by exploiting this low rattling tendency of the system to get trapped where the diffusion is weaker. So the simple thing on the, in, the, in panel A, I'm just gonna check time for a second. All right. So the, the, the simple thing in panel A is that you accumulate probability in the low energy minimum in your energy landscape when your noise has no spatial dependence. And on panel B, now what we see is when the noise does have spatial dependence and you're in a flat energy landscape, you can also accumulate energy where the noise is weakest. Uh, and so in one dimension, this is just a simple Fokker Planck equation that you can solve um, sort of in, in one line uh, where you're looking for a steady state probability that ends up being inversely proportional to your spatially varying diffusion coefficient. And now what you can do is you can combine these two effects together. So in panel C, you have an energy landscape and a rattling landscape, and you can use low rattling to push probability from low energy to high energy. So it starts being kind of a flexible frame for a non-equilibrium system. But then the last thing uh, that can happen is if you kick the system weakly enough that you're below this critical threshold and you start having orderly dynamics, you can just have an absorbing state. Whereas as soon as the system drifts, as soon as the pivot drifts to a position where you're kicking it weakly enough, the orbits become orderly and the system freezes in place and can't drift out. It has no noise in its dynamics anymore. So you have this rich possibility behavior just with two variables from the interaction between an energy landscape on the one hand and a spatially varying driving landscape on the other, where depending on your configuration, you're being driven, you're being driven differently by your environment. But of course, a pendulum on a pivot is a simple system. So the question is, how do you take this into some more complicated ones? So one of the ones we considered, uh, and, and I, this is one where I find the behavior that results quite non-trivial and exciting, and so it's fun to lead with, uh, is that you have a spin glass. So a spin glass is kind of an abstracted theoretical model of a bunch of lattice sites in a crystal that couple to each other with local interactions of magnetic moments. So for our purposes, this is just a set of arrows that can either point up or down, and then they have interactions with their nearest neighbors that make them want to either align or anti-align with their neighbors, depending on whether they have positive or negative couplings um, in this energy. And I think maybe I should have said negative or positive couplings for doing it respectively. You also can have applied fields in a spin glass. So you've defined an energy for the interactions between the spins or between the bits, whatever you wanna call them. You also can apply fields that are like forces, constant forces that are pushing on each one to try to make it flip up or flip down. And because you can have a bunch of spins, in the next slide we'll see results from a lattice with 256 spins, you can kind of have a barcode for how you treat them, right? You just pick a random set of ups and downs. You push on spin one up, you push on spin two down, spin three gets pushed down also, et cetera. So you just take a random family of barcodes and that's what these mu's stand for at the bottom. They're different barcodes. They're different patterns of which spins are getting pushed up and down. But the moment we start time varying that, then we start to have a non-equilibrium system. So we can do dynamics with this system because it has a clear physical definition. I have energies assigned to states. I can make stochastic jumping rates between states that have to do with the differences in energies and their temperatures. So it all obeys detail balance at thermal equilibrium if I don't drive the system. But once I go down here and I start changing the applied field over time, now it's a non-equilibrium system and I'm gonna surf around and explore different states in ways that partly have to do with how I'm being driven. So the first thing we do is just pick a deck of cards. I have a finite set of barcodes, randomly chosen barcodes. 
maybe 10 of them, something like that. And I just start stochastically switching. Let's try barcode one. Now we switch to barcode three, et cetera. And you switch one after the other after giving the, chance, the system a chance to relax a bit, but not too long. If you did this too slowly, you'd just be doing quasi-static motion between different thermal equilibria. So you do it fast enough that the system can't relax totally. And then what happens, which is interesting, is if you look at the work absorption over time, you start at a naive rate of work absorption that comes from being in a random initial state, but then the rate of work absorption progresses. And as the system experiences the same set of random barcodes over and over again, maybe 10 of them, the rate of work absorption will decrease in a pronounced way to the point where it reaches some new steady state value that's lower. And the reason you can tell this is significant is because then when you change to a new set of barcodes, right? You switch the drive to a new set of 10 randomly chosen applied fields that are now pushing different spins up and down. So you've switched out from one deck of cards, you have a new deck of cards. The system is now getting exposed to an environment with different statistics. The pattern of the environment has drastically changed even though it's a pattern that's taken from the same family of random environmental patterns. And so you see a transient spike in the work absorption and then a relaxation to a new steady state. And then you change it back and you see a spike again, but it actually is a bit of a lower spike because it has some memory of what it's been doing, but it still has to re-relax and, and get in step with a new, uh, or rather the original way of being driven. So it's, it's a very rich behavior, but what I think is quite striking about it is that this already in a sense is computing something about its environment in a way you might consider useful in certain ways. I mean, if you were trying to predict the environment, or if you're trying to detect novelty in your environment, both of those kinds of activities are implicit in what behavior is already self-organized in the system. Because if I behave in a violently different way as a result of my environment's pattern changing from one member of a random family of environments to another member of a random family of environments, then that shows that my internal state somehow reflects a relationship to the pattern of forcing that's quite specific and that's what causes me to undergo this bigger rearrangement when that specificity is over and I now have a new environment that I have to adapt to. So you could use this if you wanted as a novelty detector. You could say, I want this physical system to you know, behave and I'll, I'll measure a basic physical quantity of what's going on in there. And when it starts jumping around like crazy, I'll know that something really significant has changed about my environment, even though at some level that change is quite subtle because we've just been switching one set of random barcodes for another set of random barcodes. So I think the significant thing here then is that we didn't set out to do what you'd call machine learning here, but we got a result that ends up looking a lot like machine learning in some sense, right? We have many degrees of freedom. They're being in some sense optimized because their rate of work absorption is being optimized to a lower value that's matched to the pattern of the particular environment. And so they have a learned input output relationship with the environment, but we didn't have to program the system to do that. And we didn't have to define a loss function and a way of optimizing that. We get that from the dumb physical dynamics of just a bunch of spins pushing on each other and kind of jumping around at random according to their energies. So what it becomes a kind of prototypical example for is the idea of a self-organized computing behavior that's going to emerge from the physical dynamics of naive matter just because they have a lot of different states they can explore. Some of those states are better at moving in certain ways or absorbing energy in certain ways than others. And the environment has a specific pattern that kind of picks one of those or a collection of those states out of the library and says, this is where I want to get stuck. So that uh, is a first example. Spin glasses are still a bit abstract though. They, they look kind of like computers. Um, and so it's worth asking, you know, do we, do we already need to make kind of abstracted theoretical model in order for us to see a behavior like this? So the next step is to try to do something which is still in simulation, but looks a little more real world or at least less microscopic. Um, and that would be a mechanical system. So let's just use Newton's laws and see if we can do it this way. Let's take a set of masses and springs, um, and they're special springs as I'll, I'll describe in a second. Um, uh, they're not hooky in springs, but take a set of masses and springs, and we'll just make a random network of some of these masses are connected to other ones. And we quench that. We don't change which masses are bonded to which others. Um, and I'll say, by the way, that random disorder is an important part of this, quenched random disorder. We also had that over here, right, in these couplings between the spins. I think that's important because what it gives you is heterogeneity in the overall configuration space of your system. 
you want it to be the case that some configurations are qualitatively different than others in how they behave with respect to their environment. And you get that by having a certain amount of quenched random disorder in the interactions between the little basic building blocks. Now, in reality, that can often emerge from simpler pieces of the world. So even if all electrons and protons and neutrons interact with each other the same, so to speak, you clearly can get the whole diversity of chemistry if you just string enough of them together in different ways. So maybe you need quantum mechanics to get that kind of diversity from such simple interactions. I don't know, it starts to be speculative. But I think the point is that you can see this kind of behavior that you're looking for, but you're gonna to need to have some kind of chemical diversity or something equivalent to that so that there's a library of different possible behaviors, kind of like different sugars or different ways of building different organisms out of the same atoms um, that you could just find by exploring the configuration space and ending up somewhere different. So that was an interlude, but back to this mechanical system. So we have a randomly connected mechanical network Masses and springs, but these are bistable springs and they can't break. They just want to pop back and forth between being open and closed, which is really kind of long or short. So each spring down in the left uh, hand corner, you see a potential energy landscape that each bond, I should maybe call them, lives in, where the bond has forces that push along the direction of the bond between particles uh, that are determined by this potential energy landscape. So if they're far apart, they're happy. If they're very far apart, they're not happy. Etc. And they basically just prefer two different possible uh, equilibrium links. So if you take a system like this and now you just start shaking one piece of it according to some forcing pattern that you choose, like let's say we'll force it to begin with at a chosen frequency with constant forcing amplitude, then the generic behavior that you see over time is that the rate of work absorption relaxes to a lower value than you started in a naive state. So you start in some random energy minimized arrangement but then as time progresses, you end up in a state that's absorbing less energy and less energy. And you can see that if you just do stroboscopic viewing of the overall structure of the system, that at the beginning, it looks very chaotic. It's absorbing energy. It's dumping that energy into a lot of different kinds of motions because there's nonlinearity. It's kind of thermalizing it. But then as time goes on, suddenly the system has a much more orderly kind of structure to the way that it's behaving. It's a many body system that's executing a very low dimensional motion, but there's a lot of correlated and coordinated motion among the different pieces of the system. And it's learned that in a way that is specific to the drive that it's experiencing. So if I choose one frequency, then I get this behavior. And then if I switch frequencies, then I get a jump in the work rate of work absorption and I have to re-relax to some new stable state. The example I'm presenting here is a bit of a different one, but it's the same concept. You have forcing that has constant amplitude and force in this regime, sorry, in this uh, epoch. And then you go over to here and now you're doing forcing that has constant um, position amplitude of the particle being forced regardless of the force on it. So you can do both things in simulation very easily. And then you, uh, you switch back and forth between these and you just see alternations where each time you change the pattern of the environmental forcing, there's a jump in work absorption and a, rela a relaxation to a new uh, target state that is adapted to that pattern of forcing. And here you can see also that there are big changes in the normal mode spectrum uh, of the uh, local, motions that the system likes to execute when it finds its new attractor, because when you have constant amplitude forcing, you're trying to minimize resonance. But actually, when you have constant position forcing, lowering the rate of work absorption instead is about kind of coupling very soft modes to the driven motion so that they're very stretchy and they don't absorb a lot of work um, under constant. They, basically, there's no high force reaction uh, to the constant amplitude uh, of positional motion. So you have highly different physical responses that emerge in the same system just because the subtle difference of I'm either doing this constant frequency forcing with constant force amplitude or constant positional amplitude uh, and the self-organization is very different because in both cases it's trying to reduce the work absorption and find one of these low rattling attractors. So I'll show you some movies now of how this works uh, just so you can or how it looks just so you can get a sense for what it uh, appears like as, as the dynamics play out over time. So initially I just start wiggling one of these particles. I think this is a constant amplitude of forcing. Um, and, and you see that initially there's a lot of thermalization and random motion, but then when you fast forward, uh, what you're now, oops, sorry. 
So I'll fast forward here. And then you get into this state and now you're stuck. You really, you can't get out. In fact, without thermal fluctuations, if this were a deterministic Newtonian system with drag, which is the equivalent of a driven zero temperature system, then you, you really can't get out. You've actually found a closed loop that you're exponentially attracted to by the drag. Uh, so you're, you converge on a, a closed periodic attractor uh, in the dynamical uh, phase space of the system. But if you had thermal fluctuations, you might be able to wait long enough, eventually get kicked out of this, and maybe you could find another one. Um, and what I mean by that is that if the drive didn't change, then while it's true that your final state from some new fluctuation carrying you to a new state would always give you lower work absorption than when you'd initially been kicked up out of your attractor, there's a lot of diversity in the different states that you can reach that all have that same work absorption in the same environment. So it's kind of like you think about genetic diversity that can be much greater than the phenotypic diversity that you're selecting for in a given environment. There are lots of microscopic ways of being arranged that'll have the same optimized response property. So you're not gonna get the same result from multiple evolutionary experiments if you have a little bit of fluctuation. Um, I'll show you this other movie because it's also fun. You might've gotten a sense from the previous one that you always end up in some kind of structure that's aligned along the axis of the forcing. Um, that actually just depends kind of at random on how the bonds are, are slung together um, in a particular randomly quenched initial mechanical network that you're starting from. In this system, uh, you end up also in an attractor state that's stable. But what's fun about this one is you can look at the uh, dissipation rate down at the bottom, uh, and there's still this kind of longer time scale in which you see these jumps in the rate of dissipation. And the reason for that is that if you watch on a longer time scale, there's actually an emergent pumping behavior where there's energy being harvested by the system from the driven particle. And it's being basically used to act like a self-organized motor where it's doing detailed balance breaking pumping of some of its degrees of freedom around in a circle. Um, and, and that was something that we weren't selecting for, we weren't trying for, but it turns out to be kind of easy once you have a system whose motion has become very low dimensional as a result of the fact that it's in a stable attractor and at low real temperature, but it's still being driven, it still has energy flowing through it, and that energy flow is gonna have to power motion in a very low dimensional way, and so you end up with this motor-like behavior. So you could actually use that, so to speak, to, to pull a, a bucket um, up from a well if you wanted, but um, this is obviously still a simulation, so. Uh, it requires a bit more effort to see it uh, in the experimental setting. We'll get to some experiments um, where we look at this principle uh, in a second. But, but I think I just, just to recap the basic idea, again, what we're talking about is systems with many degrees of freedom where they can have different response properties to the environment depending on what kind of local region of the space of possible configurations they're currently in. And because the driven system is absorbing energy from the environment and that energy is powering its exploration of that configuration space, you end up with a situation where your ability to absorb energy from the environment uh, is gonna have a significant impact on how you explore that space and whether you can continue to explore or whether you have to stop. Um, and I think that we often tend to focus when talking about lifelike behaviors on, on things that we uh, associate with life that, that feel very tangible to us. And one of the things that's tangible to us is eating. And we think of life as needing energy input, which it certainly does. Uh, but then what we focus on is the sort of aspect of being alive that's about trying to get access to energy. And it's true that energy harvesting behaviors where you see self-organization, where the system learns to bring in more energy to the system from the environment, um, that is an example of dissipative adaptation. And we had a paper in PRL a few years ago that's about that. Um, but what's also true is that this kind of fine tuning that we're looking at here, where instead there's a transient period where there's more rearrangement, but then the system settles into a lower rate of energy absorption. There's an aspect of that behavior that is also, I think, arguably lifelike in a way that we should consider significant and be willing to ponder. Uh, and that's the following. When a living thing is in some kind of metastable non-equilibrium state where energy is flowing in and it's powering motions in the system, but then also it's leaving uh, as heat and other kinds of dissipation. So you have this directional flow of energy through the system. 
it doesn't work to say, I don't care how the energy gets in. I'll just dump the same amount of energy into the system regardless, and it'll stay alive and it'll stay healthy and all of those things. You can't take food and substitute for it an equivalent dose in joules of gamma radiation or dynamite or whatever you want. And that's kind of comical and obvious. Uh, but the reason is because a randomly chosen source of energy is like a bull in a china shop. It's going to devolve itself into all sorts of different kinds of chaotic motions in this many body nonlinear system where there can be lots of thermalization of energy if it's introduced in a, let's say, commonplace or random way. And, and so what makes a living thing remarkable is not just that it's capable of using energy from its environment to maintain itself in a particular state, but that more that it has this matched relationship where it has to absorb energy from the environment in a pattern that's like the environment in which it emerged and, and was adapted to. And so there's this sort of relationship between the structure in the system and its stability and the particular pattern of the environmental forcing. And I think you see that both in terms of the rate of energy absorption, where you are in a state perhaps where you don't absorb too much energy uh, all at once and in a way that is then gonna break you to pieces uh, and, and shatter all of the different chemical bonds um, that you're made of. But also that to the degree that you do absorb energy, you devolve it into organized motion that has a further limitation on how much it can disrupt the overall structure. So again, when you start in some random structure at the beginning and you set this kind of process in motion, the initial reaction of the system is you start absorbing a lot of energy and it starts activating more and more chaotic motions of different kinds. There's a, a lot of thermalization. It looks sort of scrambling and, and random, randomizing. But then you get over into a state where the same forcing is delivering energy into the system that's producing less motion overall. And also the motion that it does produce is of an organized sort that doesn't disrupt the overall stable structure that the system has found. Um, so I think those are characteristics that you, you see in spades when you look at living things from that perspective. Uh, and, and that's what looks to us like they're able to sort of repair and maintain themselves, that the sources of energy they experience are pushing them around the right tracks without producing uh, motion in the undesired directions. Uh, and you can get that for free, so to speak, if you're just talking about a, a many body system with a, a landscape of, of diverse response properties it can explore and where it's at a low enough temperature uh, that the drive energy is the main determinant of how it explores that space until it can kind of find an, an orderly arrangement. Um, and we indeed, uh, in, in the paper, um, that this is this work is from, which is on the archive and um, also um, uh, hopefully soon to be accepted to a journal, we hope. Um, that is something that you can study uh, directly. Uh, and, and what you find is that these attractor states, it's not just that they reduce their, their energy uh, absorption rate. It's also that the motions that they do undergo are sort of aimed at high barriers so that they can't break the system. So um, it's, it's even more trapped than you would expect given its rate of energy absorption because it's not absorbing that energy at random. It's absorbing it in ways that produce orderly motion that's well confined by the overall potential energy landscape. So you can develop other kinds of theoretical frames in which you can start to understand why a system would behave in this way. Um, one um, way of talking about it is to think about a random Markov graph. So I, I think that this is probably the most general frame in which we've looked at this for starting to argue to ourselves, why should this work in general? Because we start to find a lot of example systems where it works um, and it seems sort of intuitive, but can you make rigorous the idea of when and under what conditions do you expect this kind of behavior uh, to govern the overall steady state or near steady state behavior of a driven non-equilibrium system. And I think the key point uh, is that you need quasi randomness in the transition rates between states. So if I make a graph of nodes and then there are a bunch of random jumping rates between states and I can write a master equation for that, then in principle, the steady state probability distribution over states cannot be known from any local quantity that only has to do with the properties of one node. You need to know how everything is hooked together and how all the probability is flowing. In practice, in a randomly connected system, there's a large end limit in which you expect the steady state probability to be dominated by the exit rate of each node. Meaning that if you're somewhere where you tend to jump out less frequently, then that's where probability 
will accumulate. It, it definitely doesn't have to accumulate there in the arbitrary general case of a non-equilibrium system. But for many body systems with lots of quasi-random interactions, it starts to be a reasonable approximation to assume that the individual jumping rates between states might be taken from some random distribution. And then you can argue for this relationship. And here the jumping rate out of each node, you can think of as kind of like a local diffusion constant because the more you diffuse locally, the more you get kicked out of where you are quickly because you make a big jump to somewhere else. So we did indeed look at this in a variety of systems in diffusion, uh, in a, uh, a spatially varying uh, landscape of diffusion coefficients that depends on your location. Uh, in this random Markov system, and also in simulations and experiments with robot swarms. So the remainder of what I'll, I'll mention is recent work done collaboration with uh, initially uh, with, with the lab of Dan Goldman at Georgia Tech, who developed uh, these uh, smarticle robots I'm about to discuss. And then uh, since then, uh, the effort has become uh, even more exciting and extensive and has brought in um, uh, the lab of Todd Murphy at Northwestern, um, and, and also uh, work with Kurt Wiesenfels, who's, who's at uh, Georgia Tech as well. Um, and so what we wanted to do was go into an active matter system where we had a lot of experimental control and see if we could use the low rattling idea as a predictive principle for uh, explaining and anticipating the collective behavior uh, of these robots. And, and so the nice thing about these robots is that they need each other to move and they flap their arms according to patterns that you program. Um, and they're in a flat energy landscape in this experiment. So you can really focus on how dynamics is shaping probability flow uh, in the overall behavior. And you can put them in a confined ring and then you start to see something that is evocative uh, of low rattling behavior because you sometimes have behaviors that look kind of random but then a lot of the time the system ends up getting into these more orderly behaviors that have a really hard time rearranging themselves. So they stay in these pattern relationships to each other, but then occasionally there's a transient chaotic rearrangement and they can get into a new state. Uh, so if you take these smarticles in a ring and you start just studying the different arrangements that are available to them, you, infi you find indeed that the steady state behavior of the system is localized in these blue regions in the configuration space, even though the configuration space as a whole sampled over random noise uh, buffeting the system is this kind of diffuse red cloud. So there are all these different states the system could be in. There's no attractive interactions at all in the system, but you get into these highly localized configurations as a result of the dynamical dance that these smarticles get into with each other uh, and it's explainable in terms of, of a low rattling picture. The idea basically is that rattling uh, is something you can define locally as the amount of randomizing motion uh, that the, the system experiences in response to the way the arms are being flapped. But then you can flap the arms different ways and flapping the arms different ways produces different states that are part of low rattling trajectories for the system. And you even can create a sort of selection principle where you say, if I combine two different drives, that are gonna produce two different sets of low rattling configurations and trajectories, then the overlap of those sets is something that I can select for by combining the two different patterns of driving. So I end up getting control over the robot swarm by starting to mix and match different kinds of drives that end up producing different kinds of dynamical arrangements in, in configuration space. Um, and it also follows the intuition that in order to see a highly ordered response in the system, that you need to have a low enough entropy of the initial driving pattern. So if I have a driving pattern over here that's more random, then my distribution over states looks like it has higher entropy. But if my driving pattern is very orderly in some of these other examples, then I can get high, uh, I can get low entropy response in the where the system prefers to hang out as a result of this low rattling effect. Um, and so it, it kind of mirrors the intuition that in order for the system to have a response to the environment that is structured in an interesting way, I need the environment itself to contain an interesting pattern. And I think that's an important point uh, because what that reminds us of is that we're not gonna see really exciting self-organization in non-equilibrium systems that looks as lifelike as possible until the challenge presented by the environment contains a pattern that's complex enough uh, that it really requires, in a sense, for the response of the system to have achieved something significant um, th that we can notice. So if you were driving with a very primitively structured drive, you're going to have a hard time noticing in the response of the system uh, something that looks like adaptation because the drive kind of doesn't have a fingerprint. But 
what is becoming clear, I hope, from some of the examples that we've been, uh, we've been going through here is that many different kinds of many body systems have the potential to be computing a lot about patterns in their environment uh, if the pattern itself is just complicated enough and if you know how to look for the response and the, complexity, the, the, the complex matching uh, of the response to the system in the right way. I, I'll present um, here at the end just as a suggestion an experimental paper from another group that I really like um, that came out five years ago where they took a silicone octopus tentacle uh, and put motion sensors on it and they wiggled the end of it according to an input pattern that was randomly chosen. And then they used that as a physical reservoir and just trained a, a surface single regression layer on top to interpret the behavior of the tentacle, which is highly complex and unpredictable, into solutions for non-equal, uh, sorry, for, for non-linear differential equations uh, that the system was trying to solve. So basically, you have a, a computing resource in the behavior of a complexly driven physical system. And if you want to try in the right way, you can harvest the result of that computation uh, and use a relatively computationally cheap surface process in order to do that. So what happens when you take you know, a complexly patterned environment that is possibly random to the wrong beholder, but is actually quite ordered if you only can detect the pattern in the right way and you show that to a complex non-equilibrium system that has many different response properties, what is the evolutionary outcome of that look like? We don't know yet, but I think we're very excited uh, to push for experimental and simulated studies uh, of these ideas because it seems that a broad variety of systems have the potential uh, to, to give interesting behavior along these lines. Um, I'll close by thanking uh, from the bottom of my heart a great many people who have done tremendous work on, on all these different projects um, and also uh, excellent places to work and um, sources of funding uh, that have supported this research. Um, and uh, to finish up, uh, I will just mention that I wrote a book about a lot of these things recently for general audiences, but that still, I think, is uh, written for physicist consumers as well uh, and, and, and might enjoy it and, and, and get something out of it. Um, and so if you'd like to follow me on Twitter to find out more about things to do with the book uh, or find the book yourself, uh, in some place where it could be acquired, it's available in different forms. I, and I invite any continuation of this discussion afterwards, uh, just send me an email and I, I'd love to talk.